we're going to be really good this episode because yeah. we were really crazy last episode. Yeah, it got out of control, Sarah. Just I out feel of control. like you oh, <laughs> put it on me. You spearheaded okay, the I'll insanity. That's true. But I apologize sure was, for nothing. It was fun. Yeah, you needed one of those now and then. Yeah, so this time we'll try to be a little more subdued. We won't talk about Nostradamus or Rasputin's wiener. I do have another penis story, but <laughs> I'll save it for another day. Episode 334, less satisfying, but equally as uh, exciting. Yeah. How are you doing today? Real good. Yeah. I am headed to Pittsburgh. You seem calm about your, like, leaving for a trip. There's no, like, travel anxiety? Like, you're not revved up and... No, but I like, am excited to see my friends. Oh, good. You know how that is. Yeah. Um, That's your, like... You know, your crew. We're staying at Peg's, though. My mom. Okay. House. Usually, you know, we're yeah. not idiots. We, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> but the, I think it was, be, I forget the reason. It was like the way the schedule was going to work out with Lincoln and everything. We were like, it's just easier to stay with Peg. Because she basically takes care of him yeah. while we're there. And we actually get to go on a date, which oh, we never yes. do. He's always with us. Anytime you see a picture, Lincoln is there. It's true. Um, even if he's not in the picture. Yeah. Even with so. us. Right. <laughs> yeah, we have it's to like crop him out. Him. That's true. Um, oh, that's but, cute. So that'll be, that'll be a nice break. But um, we, the other day, had the Brain Candy Book Club yes, meet up at my so house. It was so great. What did you think of it? Oh, it was so fun. Well, first off, thank you so much, Susie, for hosting at your house because people out there. Susie has the ultimate party house. Yeah, it worked out. It is a great house. There's so much room. We had games. It was set up so perfect. Oh, it yeah. It looked so cute. Yeah, it was it was good um cuz you know, there were we tried to have stations. Yeah. We had Jenga. Yeah. Connect 4, cornhole. Cornhole. Oh, okay, but not just any cornhole. The cornhole with custom brain candy <laughs> like yeah. Boards. Yeah. That said brain candy at the top, and then on it said, what is it? Never underestimate, underestimate the power of a, like, or something A about, broken, like, a broken woman, woman who has who, yeah, rebuilt yeah. her life, yes. or whatever yes. it is. The, Just something awesome. The about Hannah that. Gadsby quote from yes. her special. Yes. Um, that was super fun. And then we had games, like, as part from them, we had. Yes. A trivia yep. about the book club. That was funny. If you're not in the book club, you're welcome to join. It's on our website. Um, and basically what we do is we choose books each month and then we meet digitally mm-hmm. online. Sarah and I go on and do a, a, a book club meeting, but mm-hmm. then people can say, what did you think of this? And yeah. like, it's all live. And There's a lot of emotions. There are tears. There's laughter. We have a great time. We have such a we good time. We gossip. Yep. We have a period at the end where we're like, let's talk about any gossip we've heard. Yep. It's so fun. Just as a palate cleanser yeah. to get back into real life. <laughs> and it was nice because at the meetup, we had some local people and then other people that flew from yes. Alabama, mm-hmm. uh-huh. um, Texas, Florida, Florida, Derek's from Florida, uh-huh. Arizona. People drove up. Northern I mean, it California. was really cool. It's the best. That people went all that way. And I mean, everybody just gets along so well and it's just our clicks. People. It really is. And I just always love how there is a, uh, uh, the MFTs show up and yeah, there's like there's MFT therapists, representation teachers, there. Yes. I college love it. professors. Yeah. Who else? Those are the main ones. Oh, a lot of people that work with special needs folks. Yes. I mean, it's like the nicest yes, people in the world. We had one of our world. favorite authors from the book club. Jana King. Yes, came. Jana King came out. She was great. I mean, so she nice. is really good. I mean, so nice. Her husband, like lovely. Salt of the earth. Yes. Could talk to them forever. And we just had a grand old time talking about whatevs. And it was just I am always impressed by our listeners Me too. and and obviously our book club members because it's almost like well, they're just like us. Yep. They're nerdy, but also into pop culture. Yes. That's kind of the balance yes. there. They want to talk about stuff that matters, but they also want to be like, did yeah. you see Kim Kardashian's new <laughs> totally. shorts? And we can get down with either thing. Yep. Yeah. You know when uh, uh, I watched that Flat Earth movie a while ago and you had asked, like, what does the crowd look like? Yeah. And I was like, well, it's really diverse, but they all are, com- they are you know, they come together on this shared 
you know, subject. Insane that they're in. belief. This is basically like us. <laughs> it's like the a Brainiacs. diverse group and then everybody just comes together and we're like, but you love books. You love smart stuff. You love also pop culture stuff. They get their grammar right. The, yes. You know yep. what I mean? Yep. That was one of our prizes. We gave away a cup that said, I'm silently correcting your grammar. <laughs> we had prizes. Oh, tsh, don't even get us started I on the prizes. I should say, because uh, you know, we have that thing in our um, store that's the your, yes. Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. I only tweet that at people that are trolling me. me too. I don't care if you get it right if you're nice. Totally correct. But if you're saying you're stupid and you do it incorrectly, correct. then it's on. Mm-hmm. Or you tell me about what I don't know about, like this is what you don't know yeah. kind of thing. Because people you, say that sometimes like, that can uh-uh. sound like education um, mm-hmm. shaming, which I don't want to do. Right. But if you're an asshole, yeah. it's I'm asshole shaming. Mm-hmm. Through the Same. lens of I did or, that to a right. fellow real worlder. What? On that tell shirt me. post that I did. Tell me. Dustin from the challenge. Yeah. He had a lot to say and said Shut I was being racist. This up. was like reverse racism. Shut and I was like, here's why that's not a thing. Shut yep. it. It was ten or so messages back and forth, back and forth, back Private and forth. Private or public? No, public. Get out of town. I won't even. <gasps> And, ooh, yeah. But this what? Is, what so, was that? What yeah. was that about, well, Sarah? this is one that just, I just, every word is capitalized. What? When he, write, when he wrote to me, every single word was Why? capitalized. How, you I would have to really try to make right, that Right, that's happen. what I said to myself. And so after a little while, I said... Uh, oh, do you mean caps lock? No, I mean... Just cap, the first just letter. Just the first that's weird. letter is capitalized. Oh my God. So what? That shirt is supposed to make mediocre white men feel inferior? It is, Dustin, dumbass. <laughs> and then after a while, I just couldn't take it. And I said, I don't know what irks me more, having to defend this shirt or your misunderstanding of capitalization rules. <laughs> just like, I don't know what I'm going to fight today because I'm done. I cannot believe, and what did he say to that? Nothing to that. That was the end he of the story. He just said, I just think there is a better way to get the point across. You're using racism to fight racism. Racism! And then I put asterisk there and asterisk your, because he got both of those wrong. No! So I had to. It's the only right thing to do <laughs> in this moment. And then I did feel bad about it the next day, but then my friend Amanda came in real hot and she was like, racism is systemic discrimination. We don't live in a society where white men and white women are systemically discriminated against. White men and white women cannot suffer from racism, prejudice, sure, discrimination, yeah, possibly, but not racism, shush. And I was like, yeah, there you go. Like, like, like. All Everybody was like... I cannot believe yeah. that. And Okay, okay. This was my other thing about Robin, the person I talked about last week or the last episode who told me that I shouldn't say that Jews are funny. My thing also is I would be willing to predict that Dustin mm-hmm. doesn't normally comment, right? You don't have an no, ongoing... No, never. Not He's ever. not been like, go get no, it, girl. Never, or not once. Good, you look beautiful never. or anything. No. There's no established... Correct relationship he decided he was this was the hill he was going to die yes it was and that's what bothered me also about robin is that there are lots of brainiacs who pipe up in general and be like i love when you guys talked about this or hey you should do an art uh, thing about this article if you only pipe up to be critical after years of silence Mm -hmm. you mean nothing to me and that's Mm -hmm. how i feel about dustin yeah this guy is not you don't have an established relationship 10 messages Okay, now I'm time. Just this guess. really bothered him because he's yes. a mediocre white man. And then that somebody, some other white guy chimes yeah. in and goes, mm, this is only a problem if you labeling yourself as mediocre, It really dude. is. Correct. Right. What? Yeah. There's one idiot. guy who's a, who's follows me and he's a doctor and he, he's a white guy, but damn, does he get it right? And I was just like, claps, claps, claps for this point or for this guy. It was great. Yeah. Would you so, like to share? I kind of would. I want to <laughs> find out. I'm trying to Sarah find... Sarah forgot she was on a podcast. No, I did. But I'm trying to find like the really great thing that he said. He said, appreciating truth and understanding history doesn't automatically make you a villain. Don't take things so personal. You can be a white man and still contribute to progress. Or you can be fragile and defensive and epitomize exactly what Sarah Rice's shirt is pointing out. As white men, we, if we actually care about 
equity, we have to be able to listen. Beautiful. Yes. And he said so many other things like not to make, not to make us feel inferior, to challenge us. Notice it says mediocre, which means which to me indicates a willful ignorance. If that's how you want to go through life, that's between you and yourself. If not, step one, accept the fact that American culture has consistently propped up white wealthy males while marginalizing others. Step two, be better. That's all it comes down to. No one is perfect. No one is saying all white people suck. If you're fine 100% with the way we, we as a society treat marginalized groups, then you are mediocre. If you're not, then you wouldn't be offended by the shirt. I'm like, thank you. He gets it. Yes. I was just like, mic drop, clap, clap, clap. Yeah. That was perfect. Thank it's, you for saying everything I wanted to get across. It's annoying that we even have to say that's what I. That's why I was like, I don't know what I'm more mad at. The caps. <laughs> Clearly. Your weird texting right. style. I know. We shouldn't get like, ugh. I can't give them more airtime, but. Even though last episode we were a little misbehaved and sassy and it was because of the alcohol, it's not stopping me from drinking today. I like that. And we are drinking fit vine. You are not wine. a quitter. No, I'm not. I'm going to stick with this bad behavior. No, fit vine wine is perfect for people. I actually had people tweeting and being like, what is that wine about? Yes. Because here's the deal. It's full alcohol, normal wine, but it doesn't have all that sugar or sulfites or additives, the things that basically give you hangovers. Yep. And so <laughs> it's basically giving you permission to have a couple drinks but not worry about like your workout tomorrow. Am I going to be able to go to the gym or go to work and feel like garbage? Um, thank the good Lord. It is high time. That and this, it tastes good. It tastes good. We were worried. Yeah, we were. We were like, this is going to be garbage. I was skeptical. <laughs> Sarah. And Fit Vine Wine me. is available nationwide at Whole Foods, Albertsons, Total Wine, Kroger, your local liquor store, or... You can visit fitvinewine.com to receive 10% off your order when you use promo code BRAINCANDY10. Ooh, I got to make sure I tweet that right. BRAINCANDY10. Mm-hmm. Shipping is free when you order a case or more. Um, again, no hangovers, please. Yes, please. What do, I mean, what do I have to do? Right. Okay. N- nothing, pretty much. You're fine. <laughs> they do the rest. Okay, so I'm glad we got that out of the way and yeah. we've settled all of that. So now what do you want to talk about? Did you see the video of the guys who didn't know how to work a rotary phone? <laughs> I did hear this was a thing though. Okay. That like if you ask millennials, yeah. like you put the rotary phone in front of them and they don't know what to do with it. Okay, I'm going to pause. There's an actual video. I'm going to pause. I have to see it. She's going to watch it and then we're going to give her a Oh, recap. I love this. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean, did they eventually, even at the end, anything? Sarah's now watching the end of the video. Oh, no, no. They never get it. And, okay, so they had, what is it, four minutes they had? Four minutes. To use a rotary phone (laughs) and dial a phone number. number. Okay, let's unpack it. My favorite part is they never picked up the ringer. (laughs) Like, step one, lift up the phone. Because it's never, it's not connected. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, I'm correct, right? Yeah. Now I'm like questioning whether or not I, I'm like, I know how to use a phone. You pick it up, <laughs> then you do the little numbers. Right. That's the order. Yeah. You can't do the numbers. Correct. Okay, thank you. It's essentially <laughs> like, like using, yourself. trying to change your television with the remote control or like channel changer, whatever you call that thing, uh, while the power's off, but yeah. pressing the buttons and yeah. going like, why won't why isn't this working? channel 11 turn it's on? It's not plugged in, right? Well, mm, you got to press on first. And here's what I don't get. I mean, several things. Because I know that the joke is always about millennials and they don't know anything, whatever. That's stupid. I don't like that. But haven't you seen a movie when people use a phone? I mean, there are movies from the 80s. I'm more worried about deductive reasoning (laughs) and like their ability to problem solve with the tools that they're given. True. Like with here, here are the materials figure out how these things go together to I feel like, like it's like a creativity problem almost. And then I wonder about having that short term at like everything, you know, we talked about when you're switching or have a phone all the time and it's switching your attention span and you like get bored easily. Mm-hmm. And so you have to fill that space and your mind doesn't have the freedom to wander and create yeah. creative solutions to things. Yeah. So it's stunted their Yes, their creative growth. growth. And being Maybe. able to figure out something like this. And just I bet and you, go, though, if you put happening. women or people of color 
in the same challenge at the same age, they would be able to do it. Wouldn't they be able to? They would. I think they would too. I think, I think a, a woman would be able to do that for sure. Yeah, in like minorities? Yes, I think so too. Why do I think that? Because they could. They could. Because... They are constantly having to figure stuff out yes. and how to manage a situation. So they honed those creative skills more. This is kind of like in line with what I'm saying of like, if you yeah. don't use it, you lose it. And they have not had to use these well, like You have to observe all yes. the time, but they like don't have to pay attention to these white guys. These They're bros, these guys. That is such a good point. That's what I think. Because even if you're a minority or a woman or any different group that you have, you to, have be to way observe, more aware. Yes. Mm-hmm. And almost like, change your behavior to cater to whatever is, I don't know. Ugh. Mm-hmm. And that's, and in a way you're not like, they're learning by doing that. And these guys aren't because yeah. they don't have to. Okay. It's only a matter they didn't of time know, before. So they didn't, be. they didn't pick up the uh, receiver. Not at all. Right. And then they couldn't figure out like, you know how when you dial a rotary, you go, and you let it then go all the yes. way back. It's, you have to they go couldn't, and then move your finger and then it goes all the way back. They didn't know how to get to the next number. Like yeah. if you were just put, like a, almost like a, a lock, you know. A, yeah. What do you call those? Oh, Padlock. Like, yeah, where you have to go past the they number thought it was and like then go that, the other way. Where then you could just do the next number somehow without yeah. letting it all. It's so silly. It does seem silly. It seems And I very... don't mean in the way of like millennials. Will so do. Right. I just mean like, as you said, intuitive. Intuitive. Yeah. Like if you gave me this item. Yes. And what, for example, on the camping trip Landon and I went on, mm-hmm. we were trying to figure out, well, Landon was trying to figure out how to make this. Um, little like tent kind of canopy, um, what would you even call it? Like an awning that mm-hmm. comes out of the side of the trailer. We didn't have the instructions for it and there was no internet connection. And Landon was like looking how to Google it and he knew like the, doing the awning was like one of the more challenging things because you got to be like precise about it and like t- two people doing it's it at the fiddly. same time. Yeah, it's fiddly. Yeah. And he was dead set on getting the information from another source where it was like, I got to look this up. I got to Google it. I got to text the guy who owns the trailer right, it's to like find our out. Default. And I was like, let's just look at it. Let's look. And it looks kind of like it would be telescopic. This little piece looks like another piece that pulls out in another part of the Airstream. So maybe we should just like both try that. Be like, no, I don't want to send, spend time wasting to look at the, like, try to figure out a solution. I just want the solution right now. Like, I want to problem solve. I'm like, okay. So I let him do that for like 15 minutes. And I'm like, I'm just going to go over there and oh, no. give it a good look-see. I mean. You're the worst. I'm the worst. I would have been so mad. You would have Because, like, mad. I've been on trips with you. Yes. The thing about you that's so annoying is that you're always right, too. Like, it's effective. Oh, it's the worst, I know. I'm like, well, that did. that is the solution. And it did work. And it took all of two <laughs> minutes once we had that it's figured so out. so annoying. And, like, I mean, what do I do in that situation? Do I, like... But I think it's because of what you're saying of like, I had to be observant and I like, because yeah. it was like, I don't get the default we don't have instructions a lot of those and nobody's hand. And I like, you know, you think, okay, like the, the say it's like a family company, you know, the dad hands the information down to the son and then da, 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 da. that's not, that's not happening over here. So it's like, you want to figure it, you want to move up oh, you want sure. it, you better go out and you better learn how to do it yourself. And now it's given me this like inflated, like sense of. I don't know. Competence. Yep. Where I'm like, I can just look at it and I'll definitely figure it out. Yeah. (laughs) Give me that nuclear reactor. I got this. Yeah, I got this. Did you, I know you've been watching, by the way, um, Chernobyl. Oh, yes. And did you see how people are now going? It's like a tourist thing. It's, I'm sure it's even, you know, become more popular, but they were doing that for a while. Well, now they're like, you know, selfies and all that stuff at Chernobyl. And people, they have to tell them like, don't go. Don't go. There. Like, isn't this, didn't you want, did you not see? What were you do- We don't care. Did you not get it? Like, people don't They're care. They're dying. <laughs> dead. Already dead. Why did you like that series, by the way? Because, mm. was it on Netflix? It was on HBO. HBO. It was genius. Why? It was so well done. And then I listened to all of the Chernobyl podcasts after. And what did you learn? What did you um, take away from it that's important? Well, the the big line, like their catch line in the movie or, or their whole, I don't know. Message. Message mm-hmm. is what is the cost of lies? Oh, man. And the man who wrote this and produced it started writing and producing and researching this before 2016. 
So the way that the cost of lies has lined up with our political climate, like what happens when you accept a lie as the truth and that becomes more important than the cost of lives? And like, what is at stake here? And it's it's something that I knew a little bit about. I mean, it happened the year I was born. Mm-hmm. So I just, it was this thing and all I knew was there was some sort of big explosion or something. Yeah, and it that's was about real what bad, I know. Mm-hmm. And then they fixed disaster. it and it, they put a sarcophagus over it and like now the wolves are radioactive and like you can't live there and blah, blah, blah. I had no idea just how close we were to a complete nuclear holocaust and just how dangerous this was and how the people who were closest had no idea and were all lied to. But their school, they were like when, so when the reactor melted and exploded or both of those things, there were other facilities, other like uh, uh, nuclear power plants in different countries that read the radiation in the air. And they were able to pick up significant enough, like there was a place in, I want to say Sweden or Switzerland, where they, they, the scientists there saw the radiation and determined that amount of radiation in their country to be too much, where none of the kids were allowed to go outside and everybody was inside. A million for, miles away. A million yeah. miles away. So far away. But the, they only secured like a 15 mile, like 15 mile radius, not even from Chernobyl. Wow. Uh, they, and they, they could have, it was totally arbitrary. Like some guy just said, oh, let's make it this much, where they didn't talk to any scientists. They didn't, and kind of the whole thing with, um, uh, uh, like the communist and, and that, like that, or socialist party was that even the, you know, Joe Schmo or whoever, like the blue collar worker can become the head guy. So there was a moment where the scientists were telling these people who are in charge and able to make these decisions, like, this is really dangerous. This needs to be, you need to be like evacuating everybody. We're all going to die a hundred percent. And and he was like, oh, what do you know? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I'm in charge and I make all the decisions. She goes, yeah, I'm a nuclear physicist. And he goes, yeah, but I'm the one sitting in the big chair. And it was like, okay, well, it, this is so twisted and so backwards. And who gets the power? And it's not, it, it was just so good. It makes me crazy. It, 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 it will. It, like, I, I lost a lot of sleep over that episode. That's why I can't watch the um, When They See Us. Oh. <gasps> I can't. I did. I watched the first three episodes. Don't. I mean, I'm, do you? Ha- it's so good. But uh, one thing you'll you, be mad. You should definitely do that. Won't make you mad. Oh, is using some great lube. <sighs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Sarah>. <laughs> Something that helps. I would like some sort of metal metal for transitioning from Chernobyl to, and when yes, they see us to, to lube. lube. That w- Thank you, Sarah. So. Guys, have you tried? No, ladies, I should say. Or guys. Well, yeah, but I, I just don't want to do like the male language. Oh, f- for sure. Okay. Ladies. You know how lube usually tastes like garbage and smells like a bleach? Yeah. And, like a weird um, chemical. Yeah. And like you're in a lab. Yeah. And tingly and like and uncomfortable. No, thanks. Not at all. Uh, Omax O-Shot has a, a CBD arousal oil that contains eight natural botanicals that give you a t- tingling without that weirdness that yes. you don't like where you're like what the devil yeah, like is it's going burning. on <laughs> i need to rub it off this is so bad fire in the yeah, hole yeah 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 <laughs> and you'll get the effects that you want like stimulation circulation arousal lubrication desire yes please overall sexual satisfaction we should do our sexy boy i don't even have a sexy boy just like that um and it'll increase your relaxation. And you know how like getting the big O is a lot about your head. Uh, totally. Getting your head right. Yes. And this can help you because it'll increase your relaxation and your ability to sort of like Enjoy get in the it. moment. Yeah. It's all like that. Yes. So you just put a, little, a pump or two on there, get things cooking, 
And then you get 30 to 60 minutes of good times. It does last for all. I was surprised. Mm-hmm. It's perfect. Yeah, it doesn't wear off. Even if, you know, someone is tasting it, for example. <sighs> getting hot in here. Whether you're single or looking to spice up your relationship with a more satisfying sex life, every woman can benefit from more enjoyable orgasmic experience. Yep. Omax Oshock comes to the rescue and provides heightened sexual sensations, which give you an instant and long-lasting satisfaction you've been looking for, and it's 100% safe and natural, which I love. Remember, go to Omax health.com today and enter code brain candy take advantage of this incredible savings that's o-m-a-x health.com and enter code brain candy to get 20 percent off o shot and all their uh other omax oh, products have to check I out like. the other ones yeah they have really nice stuff oh because that because w- i was like checking yeah. what's going on here i bet they have like uh, okay i'm gonna have to see i talk- they have, like bath stuff they have everything i thought they would they have I tons want a of CBD, stuff like bath stuff you, you can take it. after working out like relax your muscles they mm, have before you go you to need. bed i love that and I talked to the guys uh, from the company, and I was like, you guys are doing the Lord's work. Yeah, Thank amen. you from all of us to all of you. <laughs> um, wait a minute. Yes. So, yeah, the they when they see us. Oh, yeah. Tell me. Oh, my gosh. It, you really see, oh, my gosh, where do I even start with that? There, There's, everybody has to see it because you see what, of what people are fighting against, like what is really to this day, to this day, for real, yeah, and how winning or uh, like being the one who like writes the narrative or creates the story is so important that they are willing to just sacrifice the whole families for it. Wow. It's it's so sad. It was it's hard to much. not cry. It was, oh my gosh. Well, I listen to the podcast, The Read, every now and then, and I love it. It's so great. What's that about? Um, it's, I mean, how do I, like. Are you saying R-E-A-D? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, I would say it's definitely for an African-American, like, audience. But sure. I, freaking, I mean, it's great. I love yeah, it. It doesn't yeah. say, like, we own this, you know, what else? Yeah, yeah. Of course. And uh, I love it. I love the hosts. They're so funny. They're always talking about stuff I love, like the Real Housewives and like, you know, who's like people's babies, celebrity babies and stuff like that. But just like giving a real breakdown of everything. And That sounds like the perfect show for you. I know. Yeah. It's amazing. And I love, I love it. It's so funny. I'm always laughing. And they, the hosts were saying like, I'm going to watch it the first week and I'm just going to like play it in the background of my house because I, I know how important the first week, like, uh, uh, ratings mm-hmm. are and yes. like you want to support them yes. and everything but both the hosts were like i am not ready mm-hmm. i i have to I, that's how i, have I to feel be, like my heart is not right i have to like make sure and one host was like i'm gonna sit down tonight and watch it but i've made sure to like cancel my plans for that because you will be i mean if you're a person with a soul will be like <sighs> you remember how cr- donald like, trump took out the and, ads in the and the oh my God, Donald and they Trump totally talk out, about it in there. A uh, whole page ads, I believe. I don't know if it was in the New York Times or what, to yeah. say that the Central Park Five needed to thirty thousand dollars. That ad cost, and Something they like that. he wanted the death penalty to be, <sighs> and these guys didn't do it. Didn't do it. And and you see everything that led up to that night, where it's just like a bunch of boys, like my brothers, shenanigans, were normal it's just shenanigans. teenage boys shenanigans. That's that, why. Oh, that boys will be boys. Like it's 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 not even that bad. It's like what I talked about how things that I have done in my life yeah. that were like just silliness. That if I were a person of color, I would still be in jail mm-hmm. uh, yeah. uh, for dumb stuff. Yep. Oh my gosh, it's so true. It makes me sad. It really does. And like these kids were just being kids, and if they were a group of white guys. Nobody would have even looked the other way. Makes me sick. It really, and it does. And it, that when you see the, what the lawyers do, and so there's like the district attorney and then there's the- Oh yeah, the, that lady. Uh-huh. Did you see her op-ed? She no. Wrote? Oh, am I going to be Washington mad? Post. I'm going to be furious, aren't You'll I? You'll be furious. She's I'm basically so angry. like- I'm getting what? mad right now, actually. She wrote an op-ed and they shouldn't have published it in my opinion. Yeah. Because we don't need to give white ladies a voice. No, I shut mean, up. Yeah. This podcast is enough. 
Yeah. Yeah. No joke. <laughs> yeah. But she was saying like, there were, re- they had blood on them. There were reasons we thought they did it. And lies. All lies. All lies. Yeah. So oh, anyway, yeah. it's gross. Let's change the subject because it's getting too Totally. Gross. But you should definitely check out the Read podcast because it's really fun when you're done listening to this one, you know. Did you see our friend, uh, our Brainiac, Christine, posted a article about how in everyone's face, there are um, little mites that live. <laughs> <laughs> you just made all the blood go out of my body. <laughs> they are called face mites. And face they, mites. They live in your pores, they eat your grease, and they mate on your face in the nighttime while you're sleeping. Well, you know what? Good for them. Getting busy. I'm glad that, that you know... When my bed isn't getting busy by me, that somebody else is getting busy in it. Yeah, they go in there. They like to eat that. What's it called? Sebum or something? Oh, that gross word from when we were talking about the Parkinson's person. <laughs> I you can smell it's it. Familiar. Ah, yeah, it's the worst word. It's basically like lube for your face. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's Omax disgusting. for your face. <laughs> <laughs> the bugs are hungry for it, and they love eating it. It's not harmful, of course. Not. I. I. I imagine I want these guys on my face. Are they eating dead skin? No. No, we don't want them. No, they're just like slopping around in your grease. Oh, I'm not good. I'm not I'm not about this. Because I did hear, are these like in the same, are these the same bugs or related to the bugs that live in your eyelashes? God, I don't know. Because I heard, I heard about, that's the only place I heard them. It's either yeah, eyebrows or eyelashes. Do you think that they prefer makeup or no makeup? Good. Because they oh, are drowning in mascara makeup, for me. I would imagine. Ooh. Because it holds on to bacteria and stuff. Oh, so they chomp away? Maybe. But we like them or not? I don't know. You read the article. No, no, the ones on the eyelashes. Oh, I think I think we like them. I think it's just like they're there. I know. That's how it is. It's like what? It's not yeah, that big of a deal. Right. I don't know. Those it, are things where I'm like, could have gone without knowing that. True. Sorry. That's good. I mean, some bacteria are good and some are not good. Right. And if you want some good bacteria, you got to get some gut right. Uh, you know what? I was listening to our episode of the podcast the other <laughs> You're day. You were like, I got to get some of this Yes. Stuff. <laughs> because I'm like, I, this is like really important and I am not doing a good job. And, you know, I ain't getting any younger over here. No, we're not. You know. I'm sick. I know. It's the worst. So what ifs? Yeah. If we lived in a culture that loved old people, then it would be different, <laughs> but we don't. So, well, you know. It's really no matter what your age, though, you want to get those good bacteria yes. because if you're gut biome or whatever the heck it's called is balanced and doing what it's supposed to do, you're going to be healthier. But a lot of us are dealing with crap in there that's not good for you. So you want to take gut right because it helps you get everything in order and it helps you um, get the mod biotics that you might be missing in your diet It'll give you the vitamins that you're missing or the things that you're missing if you're not getting the right vitamins. Mm-hmm. Um, and it keeps you balanced and all that jazz. It's like too advanced for my understanding of anatomy. <laughs> I just know that it's true. Yeah. You definitely need it. <laughs> I've seen these documentaries. <laughs> That's why I'm like listening. I'm like, God, I got to get that. What the heck? What am I, I mean, it on? is true. I know. Disease That's begins in the gut. It does. All disease. So Inflammation, all that stuff. For real. Get your gut right today. Visit atpscience.com slash get gut right and get 20% yes. off your first order plus free shipping when you use coupon code brain candy at checkout. Offer limited to the first 100 customers to use the promo code. So go to at, sorry, atp science.com slash get gut right for but like not off. like right this second because like make sure no, i get that 100 yeah i need to be in the 100 <laughs> so like maybe like wait for like <laughs> and use our code brain candy for that um that's hilarious but also true yeah um let me ask you a question about oh you have yeah. stuff no I no ask no, me a no, question you go. ask me a question Sarah, tell ask them ask me a question no okay go. do you need me to tell you something i will how about <laughs> how there was a giant anaconda that lived in captivity that gave birth without ever having any contact with males. Okay. Yeah. She did what they call a virgin birth that this snake... Oh my God, it's yes. like the Messiah. Yes. They have something called <laughs> parenthogenesis, meaning that... Uh, was it in a manger? When they... Oh my God, you're so funny. Probably. Uh 
the anaconda, known as Anna, is eight years old. Oh my God, it even sounds biblical. It does. You're totally (laughs) right. Eight years old, 10 feet long, weighs 30 pounds. She's a green anaconda native to South America and the heaviest, like it's the heaviest snake species out there. And in January, she gave birth to a whole bunch of babies and... They, most of the babies were stillborn and another died after a few days, but there were two babies that did manage to survive. And they looked at the DNA of the babies and they are a genetic clone to the mother. Isn't that crazy? Well, how did she do that? Though? So there's something that happens in snakes. There's a name for it. It's called... Uh, da, 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 um, yeah, parenthogenesis. It's like what it said. So basically that you're born from just the parent and it's only a single singular parent and what happens when it happens in some reptiles um they did say that it also has been seen in rays and sharks and some birds where if this male population is really scarce like if the they noted that there are no males in their habitat then bio like breeding becomes more even more important and so the body will almost like clone itself because having one or two viable offspring is more important than is something rather than having like 20 with an actual snake that was like a male snake and that they don't live as long. They have heart, like they have problems. Like the snakes te- gen- generally don't like live as long as a, a the snake. The clones, you yes. Know, they don't live as long. No. Why? Because they're, they don't they're have. They're inferior. They, yes. They don't have the mixed genetics yeah it's just the same genes being duplicated and so these these snakes are are still alive but they're the other ones say that they so it says that there's a small cell that contains genetic material left over from egg cell formations and this is what grows and they just use it as like a last ditch attempt to reproduce if they don't come in contact with any males for an extended period of time but it gives like low genetic variation among the population why do you think it's only in certain species Kind of makes me think that those species are really important for the balance of the ecosystem. Yeah, that's like we need snakes. We need snakes to eat the mice. We need could you imagine if you like somehow I mean, I feel like that in our own neighborhood where there's been an imbalance in the snake and rabbit population in like one area there's a, a, a rattlesnake infestation. And then like in our front yard, there's a rabbit infestation. It's like yeah. everything's thrown off balance. Okay. So I'm thinking that maybe it's these certain species that are kind of predatorial in a way. Mm-hmm. And because uh, all of the ones listed. Yeah. Are, right. Their job is almost like population control of another species. Yeah, right. You know, I mean, that's that's like Sarah's got a. I can't no, say theory right. anymore because I have to say hypothesis because I was listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson and he was like, "It's a hypothesis, not a theory." And I was All like, right, oh, he's Sarah's right, but it hypothesis. doesn't roll off the tongue. No, it does as the same, Neil. But maybe I wish nature would find a way to get bunnies to stop. Pro, like you know, breeding like bunnies? Yeah. No joke. Because maybe we could use a little bit of help in that area instead of creating more hideous snakes. <sighs> right. Right? Yeah, Anna. I cannot believe that. Yeah. I don't like it, it one bit. It says that the offspring appear to be doing well. They're, I'm not happy. Isn't gross. that gross, though? It Do does kind of gross you out. Are they, um, no, they're constrictors. All right, that's yeah. less scary. We've talked about this. I mean, I don't want to be right. Mush oh, to death. It's the worst. But wouldn't you rather have that than have a freaking rattler onto you? You can survive that. You're I don't not care surviving about surviving. Bite from a, you're not surviving. <sighs> to me, it's not about surviving. No, it's so. Oh my god, <laughs> so it's so dumb. long and painful with the constrictors. So painful. Is there any way out of that? No. And then they time their constricting to your own breathing. Every time you exhale, they squeeze tighter no. so that you can't take a deep breath in. And you're basically it's suffocation. like... suffocation. <gasps> yeah. They are listening to your biorhythms and killing you based off of your own breath. That's about as fucked Stop up as it, it. gets. Stop. That's creepy. I can't with that. So that's my story about snakes. Hey, Dahlia, do a poll about... Would people rather be bit by a poisonous snake mm-hmm. or squeezed to death by a constrictor? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> um, but the main point of the story was that snakes have smartened up and replaced all males. 
Yeah, yeah. I should just go with that. Yeah. They 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 wised up and they're like, we don't even need to, guys. Move along. We'll just have a couple of offspring. They'll be fine. I just, I wish I understood the how, how that works. Yeah, but the where, weird thing is they're both females. So you've almost put. What do you mean they're both? Like the, she had two babies that survived out of the bunch. Both survivors were female. Both survivors were because they're clones of the mother. Oh, right. So they have to be female, right? I thought I was thinking that too. Yeah, good point. And so by creating two more females in the population that aren't don't have males available to breed, you're really in a way kind of like making the species good go downhill. It's super witchy. It's kind of it feels right. witchy it to me. It might be like the she snake did a thing. Potion. I know it is. It is, right? Yeah, if it were like a um uh like dingo. Right. Yeah, oh, dingo. <laughs> yeah. Or something. Totally. It would be like, okay, that's yeah. cool. Okay. But it's like a fucking yes. witch snake. No male genetic contribution. Oh man, yes. I love that. That makes me really happy. And creeped out, which is the best story. Another thing that makes me happy is when I need something, but then I can just order it on Instacart. Yes. And it's in my hands in an hour. Uh, or shorter than that. Remember when we ordered it oh the other day God. at the party? And Susie was like, who, who showed up two, uh, 20 minutes early? And it was really our Instacart guy. I placed an order when we were having the meetup. Because you know when you're throwing a party and you yes. realize you're forgetting certain things. And I placed an order. It was so fast. I so fast. still to this moment don't know. They must have already been at the store. They must have. Because you looked at me like... I thought some, mistake. I truly thought some brainiac yeah. was showing up 20 minutes early to the party and I was furious. She was like, you who, go get it. She yeah. sent me to the door. <laughs> I, I was sense. like, I'm on it. I was like, what kind of an a-hole shows up for a party early? Cause it's not very nice. Right. Do. You don't do that. Right. But it was unless it's like me showing up to your party, early, which is allowed. It was so fast. It was under a half hour, but yeah, I mean, I know that's real. not typical. Right. So just know that yeah. if you don't get into cart, yeah, yeah, don't. Cr- but that was amazing. You can have groceries delivered in as fast as an hour or less, yeah. <laughs> um, or whatever time that works with your schedule. They have coupons, so like I've ordered um, beer and stuff like that, and it'll be three dollars off this twelve pack oh, cool. or whatever you're getting. Um, just go to, you can get the app so you can put it on your phone or go to instacart.com and then like anything that you need, they keep the hot items hot, the cold items cold. Mm. It's just, I'm very convenient. You don't have to go out and sit in traffic and all that stuff. Try Instacart and get $10 off your first order to get this limited time offer. Go to instacart.com or download the mobile app and enter promo code brain candy at checkout. It's $10 off your first order today at instacart.com or through the mobile app. And don't forget to enter our code brain candy instacart dot com or through the mobile app with our code brain candy etch. Um okay, moving on. Do you uh-huh. this is the question. Uh-huh. Do you tip your hotel maid oh. or housekeeper? Oh, good question. Sometimes yes. Me too. Sometimes I have not. What what determines whether you do it? You know it's interesting because now that I think about it in some of the big fancy schmancy hotels, it's not, we don't, but it's like in just a regular hotel, like the Marriott. Like a, yeah, the, Marriott. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You do? Yeah. And what did you well, do? Like, like a, five bucks? Yeah, ten bucks? Like ten bucks like on that? the bed or depends on like how long I've been there. Maybe like a 20. I've been there for a little while. Yeah. If my husband's with me, definitely more because, uh, well, like, you know, the 20 or something because... He's like that guy who... He's a big tipper. No, he takes full advantage of being at a hotel and throws his stuff everywhere. I <laughs> clean the hotel. When I stayed at he's the hotel for... When I, I remember, yes. He's like, oh, I'm at a hotel. Oh, oh my oh God, my I God. did it. I hit the microphone. I said I wasn't. I was going to blame... And I blamed Susie before. And here I go doing it. Gosh darn it. <laughs> big, I did the big hands. Uh, so he... Yeah. So he's like a, a you know throw everything about kind of person. Uh, when I was waiting to start the Brooklyn season, they had us like, you know, in a hotel room for like a week or two and I made the bed with the maids. We made it together. Why? Because I didn't, I, because I was, I, I wasn't allowed to leave my hotel room Okay. the whole time. They wouldn't even let me go to the city. I was like trapped in this room. Yeah. And what am I going to do? Sit there and twiddle my thumbs while they make the bed? 
that seems rude. So I was like, you get that side, I'll get that side. And Did we they like, like it? We were, became like friends. And, you know, so I am a clean, I organize before me anybody too. who cleans. Oh, I'm a big fan I do of that. that. Yeah. I mean, and I like, the housekeepers who come to my house, I like apologize if I, you know, didn't know they were coming. Because I'm like, I didn't get a chance to tidy up before you came here. I always have to tidy up before, because you have to. <laughs> and so I'm like, you know, already arranging things. I feel like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I get, I see them. We're a team. Here you go. Here's your tip. Yeah. So, you know. I'm like you though. It does depend. It's weird that in the fancy places, I feel like I don't as much. I, it's not like I do. Mm-hmm. It's only in the ones that. They what probably is that need about? it more. I, think maybe I mean, it's in maybe my there's head. a perception that they're not being compensated. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. The article that I read, I think it was in the Atlantic and it was encouraging. Maybe it was the New York Times. It was encouraging people to tip. Yeah. Um, and. My friend Kelly, her mom used to be a housekeeper in So hotels. did my mom. Oh. Yep. What does your mom say? She said, that, well, she loved it. She didn't say anything about the tipping, but she said oh. that she, that was one of her, she loved doing that job. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Kelly said definitely tip all the time because they work so hard. They yes. get so little money. Um, And the article that I read was really good because it does encourage you to do that. And it was explaining how they do get so little and then... Do you remember when um, Maria Shriver left Arnold because he had, act co- you know, uh-huh. ironically, yeah. he had um, banged his housekeeper. Yes. yes. And so she was having to stay in hotels and that's when she noticed oh. all these people that were underpaid and really? overworked. And so she wanted to change that. And so she had met with the oh. uh, CEO of Marriott and was like, you should leave a little envelope. Yes. And that way people know that. This you know, is it's customary. customary. Yes, they need to know that. Yeah. And so they did it, and then people just left notes like, hey, Marriott, maybe you should pay your maids appropriately instead of asking the customers well, to pay. That's also a good point. Good point. Well, and Both. also tip culture. That's what they said. In general. Tip culture is not absolutely uniform. Not uniform. And the, based on the things I've read about it and the articles I've read, that it's based in like a slave culture where it was a way to keep people who were wealthy wealthy and people who were not in it tip it's, culture? it start yes that it has some roots in slavery for real oh, i have i have to get wow. more information to be able to like really speak on it but that it is not it's not the solution not the solution um and so then they got a lot of backlash so now hotels are not doing that what they're not doing the envelope because they know that customers think well you should just pay your staff properly and so then there's like almost like no answer um so if you are especially if you're messy or require a lot definitely yeah that's why yeah a little bit of money my concern has always been like i hate that you can't just leave for example you know they'll leave a line for tipping the if someone brings you room service no there's no like line to tip right. the staff. The only place where I can think that there is is cruises. Oh right. Where it becomes a whole thing. Yeah, you gotta add to your bill. Yeah. And then they like make it so they're making like the cute little things with the towels on the bed and da 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 da. Yeah, I yeah. just typed just something so general into Google and the first article that comes up is go says Amer- uh, American tipping is rooted in slavery and it still hurts workers today. Yep. Wow. Yep, 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 yep. That's real complicated, though, because if you, in England, they don't have tipping for servers at uh, restaurants, and right. you can tell. Same in Italy. Service is terrible. We talked about that when we were in Italy. It makes me crazy. It's like, well, I there's guess no we're not incentive food for them ever. to hurry. They get the same amount no matter what. Mm. So I don't. I would like to know the solution yeah. where you have a good worker, fast service, yeah. and they get paid, it, you know, appropriately. Mm. Well, I will say that the one place that I I did not tip because I couldn't even afford it was Norway. They were making double hourly what I was making. Like Ooh. the people cleaning the hotels. Oh, $26 they make a nice dollars wage. an hour. Okay. And I was like, well, <laughs> I'm not making that. So I'm right. like I'm like maybe I should go into this business, stay here. 
I couldn't even believe it. They were, they, they're so. How did you know what they were making? Because we, I had read an article while I was there about, oh, go, go figure. Of this course. is like all I do. Sarah. Ugh, I'm such a weirdo. The, uh, that it was talking about minimum wage in that country and yeah. how it's one of the countries yeah, with the highest nice... minimum rate wage and that mm-hmm. they take care of everybody, but the taxes are really high and, but who cares because look at all these services and da da da. Yeah. And that they had a breakdown of like what the average like hotel made, you know, hourly wages. It was $26 an hour. I remember that. Like it was because I, I remember the woman who was cleaning up and she looked like me. It was, she was like 20 something, like cute, blonde, like, and I was like, I could totally do this job like this. I would absolutely do this job. And she looked happy doing it. And I was like, I love organizing. I would love this job. Yeah. You want to get to a point where you're envious of the housekeeper pay. Yeah. That's what I want. That's a good, that's a good system. That's a good, yeah. And as I'm coming off of the challenge and I'm like, she's making more than me when I really break this down for Mm -hmm. how long I've been working at this job, like the challenge and how many hours I've given and how my weekly pay is. I'm like, yeah, she's making more than me. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I'm all for mm -hmm, that. mm -hmm, Me too. Um, We have a guest. Oh, yeah, I love a guest. Before the guest comes on though, I want to tell you about something. And that is Dave.com which is a solution to those horrific overdraft fees you get on your bank statement all the time. If you don't pay attention and then, you know, it's too late and then you get charged a gazillion dollars. And finally, somebody was like, oh, that's not necessary. And that is the Dave app, dave.com. It's the number one budgeting app in America because it saves you those overdraft fees. It tells you about your upcoming bills and it can advance you $75 from your next paycheck with no credit check and no interest. And it's just $1 a month. So it's $12 a year, which is way less than an overdraft fee, even one, and you'll that you'll never have to pay again. Um, Mark Cuban is an investor in Dave because he got crushed by overdraft fees in his 20s and wants you to never have to pay them again. And the worst thing is that the big banks make like $33 billion off of overdraft fees a year. So why not take some of their money away and put it in your pocket um, and you can save up to $550 a year. Go to dave.com slash brain candy. It really helps the show if you let them know you heard uh, about them from us. And then download Dave and then you'll never pay another overdraft fee again. It's immediate savings. Go now to dave.com slash brain candy spelled just like it sounds d a v e dave.com slash brain candy um but yeah that's the scoop on that so our guest today is the author of a book called the art of happy moving oh i was wondering what that was on your desk i was like you plan on moving soon (laughs) how to declutter pack and start over while maintaining your sanity and finding happiness by Ali Wensk, who is a delight. Well, I feel like just moving from being in grad school to not, I need that book. I know. A lot of life transitions. Life transition. I need that. You will benefit from this. Yes. I love this book because it's sort of like, it's a guide, mm-hmm. but it also leaves pages for like you to fill in oh, stuff. I love that. You do love that. I love that. Sarah loves an interactive yes, book. Yes, I do. She knows me so well. And she covers things that I didn't see in other books. And she talks about how there was really a gap in the market. This not is cool. Dealing with something that she said the average person, I think she said moves 11 times in their life. And none of us really know how to do it. That's so true. Right? That's so true. And some of the things that she talks about that I really valued for my own life, because we move a lot, yeah. is how to deal with kids, how to deal with pets. I saw that pet section. How smart. How to make friends as oh. an adult in a new city. Well, that's... It's hard. It, you know, I'm even in that same boat right now. Yeah. Just, you know, when you're transitioning, transitioning. in your life, yes. you think like, oh gosh, like, I don't know where, who am I in this new space or in this new job or whatever it is that you're transitioning yeah. to. I love this book. Me too. It's really beautiful. Yeah, it is. Well illustrated. And she's just really nice too. Well, one of her pieces of advice on how to make friends in your neighborhood neighborhood is start a book club See? or join one with your friends. <laughs> 
right? She gives a lot of great advice. Cool. And I thought, oh, I never would have thought of that. Yeah. And also just if you're into the Marie Kondo <sighs> thing, you will love it too because she gives advice on like, you know, what to keep, what to, how to pack, where to go, what to do. It's just helpful. I love this list of friendship goals. Mm-hmm. How many local friends do I need to be happy? Right? Like, sir, yes, this is so good. And she gives advice about like, you know when you're thinking of moving and you think, this, is great. this city is perfect for me. Uh-huh. She recommends making a list of what you like about where you live now. Cool. Because you take it for granted and then you just assume it'll be in the new place. <gasps> True. I didn't know I would miss restaurants that like, for goodness sakes. Yeah. Thai food. Right. Like if you love Thai food where you it. live and you're about to move, maybe you should check and see if they have a Thai food place. Well, I did move and then they didn't they have didn't. a Thai food place. Yeah. It's awful. It's just stuff you wouldn't think of. Right. So I think it's cool. fun. I it's a this. great book, The Art of Happy Moving by Allie Wensk. And she's also really nice. I'm you looking forward to knowing what she has in her trunk. <gasps> we'll find out. Yay. All right, people. Enjoy. Welcome, Allie. Thank you so much for coming on Brain Candy, Allie. I love your book. How are you feeling about it? Um, great. I'm excited about it. Thank you so much for having me today. My gosh, my pleasure. Because people are going to have, they're going to be into this because this is like the problem <laughs> that we all have. <laughs> it's like, oh, dang, we have to get our life together. How did you become the expert? Trial and error, right? <laughs> Trial and an error, and my husband, yeah, and my husband Dan and I moved ten times in eleven years, so we had a lot of practice. Yeah, why were you guys doing that? Uh, we moved because of jobs and school, and then to follow his dreams, and then to follow my dreams, and then because we thought we were moving to a place that would be our forever home, and then we realized it wasn't, and then we moved back. <laughs> so lots of different reasons. Were you someone who? you know, moving was no big deal and you're just naturally really good at it or was it difficult for you? There were different parts when it was difficult. Like in the beginning, we had no idea what we were doing. And so the moving logistics were a little more complicated when we were first starting out. And then later, the emotional side of it was much harder. When you're moving with kids and you have a lot more stuff, then it's a different side of moving. I mean, I had never experienced before, so so it changed as we got older, like what the hard parts were. Well, I really enjoyed uh, parts of the book where you revealed some of the things that you did that were maybe maybe mistakes at times. <laughs> I mean, I was really entertained because if you, anyone that's ever moved knows that, you know, you kind of do screw up because there's just a lot to consider. So mm-hmm. I was wondering if you could share some of these stories that you learned from. Sure, of course. So one of our earlier moves, we were moving, um, at this point it was from Ohio to California, and we thought it would be a really good idea to put a car cover over our car because we're driving at 2,500 miles. You know, we didn't want tons of mosquitoes on it and everything. Like, we're just like, we'll keep it clean. We'll put a car cover on it. So we're driving on I-80. We hadn't been on the road very long. And some guy, like, pulls up next to my husband, Dan, and is, like, trying to flag us down. And we're like, whatever. We're in a moving truck. It's going to be slow. Like, I love okay. that visual. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so then we, we look in the rearview mirror and... Our, we were driving a U-Haul truck, and we have our Honda Passport on a trailer behind it with the canvas car cover. And we look in the mirror, and behind us, the trailer now is to the left of the truck. And we look again, it's to the right of the truck. And it just started swinging back and forth, left and right, and left and right, fast at this point, where it's then like the the tail is wagging the dog, where it's, it took <laughs> our entire truck all the way, like Dan is trying to make it over to the side of the highway, it makes it all the way over to the side. And we stopped and we were okay, <laughs> but it was really scary. And we found out that a canvas car cover is a really <laughs> impressive parachute. <laughs> it was scary. We learned. And I was telling this story recently at a, a book talk and someone said, I am so glad you told me that because I was about to do that. We were about to put a car You're cover saving on our car. Lives. And so I'm like, that was saving lives. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like in addition to the tarp, which is hilarious because nobody got hurt, but <laughs> I cannot believe you tried to, or you moved on your own from Ohio to California. For me, it's like, I'm not doing that without movers. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> 
I don't know. We were we just got the U-Haul truck. And You're brave. One of the mistakes. <laughs> one of the mistakes we made too is we didn't. At, again, this was early on in our moves. We just didn't declutter as much as we should have. Yeah. And so, well, you know, it's the last minute, and you're stressed, and you're hungry, and tired, and we're trying to shove everything to the, into the truck, and it didn't fit. And so, at that point, we left like our two favorite beach chairs, which is the only thing of all of our moves we've decluttered a million times. That's the only thing I've missed. Oh <laughs> so we my left God. our beach chairs there on the side. <laughs> and so I learned like you need to plan early. It's so important to start early and declutter as much as you can beforehand so you don't lose your favorite beach chairs. <laughs> That's sad. Do you still think about them? <laughs> I we rebought them. I mean they were like okay. ten dollars at CBS. They were not like <laughs> but they're we your ended favorite. up rebuying them like three times. But <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> when you set out to make this book, what was your vision? What did you want to accomplish? The main thing I wanted to accomplish was I really wanted to focus on the emotional side of moving because there are 35 million people who move every single year, and yet there is nothing about moving out there. Yeah. You walk into a Barnes & Noble, and until today or until you know a couple weeks ago, there was no book about moving that you could find at the store. And the emotional side of it was, was really hard. We moved to Knoxville, Tennessee from Chicago, and it was really difficult for me to make friends. Mm -hmm. And that had not happened before. We had moved so often. And then also, you know, just dealing with the kids and all of that. It's it's really hard. And so I was hoping to help people with, you know, the stress of all the logistics of moving, but also what happens afterwards when the moving box, boxes are unpacked, you're in a new city, you don't know anybody. How do you rebuild your life from there? And so I'm hoping to help people with both pre-move, but also after move of ways to be happier once you get there. Well, I think it's such a good point because when people are approaching a big move, th there's so much immediate stuff to consider that I think we do forget, oh, and then you're going to be there and you have to have a life. And nobody, mm -hmm. like you said, nobody tells you how to do that. Especially like as an adult, Nobody's really looking for new friends, so you have to insert yourselves into people's lives. How in the heck are mm -hmm. we supposed to do that, man? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It is. It's really hard. And it was, so I just saw on Facebook a couple of days ago, someone posted in our community. They said, you know, I've lived here for a couple of years. I'm working full time. I have my kids and I, I haven't made friends and I really want to meet people. And there were, I think, like 175 comments in this closed group of people saying, me too, me too, I feel lonely. I, yes. Like, this is, it, it's happening everywhere. And it's something that I'm hoping, you know, I feel like people have been discussing it more, and I think that's great. Um, but one of the things that is really important is to get out there and to be outside of your home. Like, it's so easy to just be like, I just want to watch yeah. TV or finish unpacking these boxes, but even little things like hanging out at your mailbox a little bit longer or mowing the lawn or just something where you're seen by your neighbors. Getting a dog is actually great. You can go outside That's and meeting other people. Um, but then also to do something that you love for what you want to do instead of just trying to meet people. Because I think that's one of the mistakes that I made too when we were in Knoxville and I was lonely and I, you can sense that like people know when you're feeling desperate for friends. So mm. if you just go do something that you love because you love to do it, then people will be attracted to you because you have a similar interest, because you seem happy, because you're engaged and then friendships will develop from there. Yeah. I noticed that because I'm, I work from home and when I moved here, uh, well, I'm in LA now, I moved here from Pittsburgh. I've been here four years. I still have like two friends. And uh, it's partially because of what you're describing. It's so much more comfortable just to stay in my house and, mm -hmm. you know, talk to you than <laughs> it is to go out. But I noticed one place I really love going is the library and mm -hmm. there's really nice people there. <laughs> and yeah, we have the I same the interests <laughs> and they're kind mm -hmm. and they're good and they like learning. I'm like, these are my people. So I think you're onto mm -hmm. something with the idea of like, you're not going out and just saying, I'm going to go find a friend. You're participating in activities you love and then you naturally are more inclined to meet people, right? Yeah. And and I think a lot of us feel introverted and are nervous about going out there. And there are things you can do. Like one of the things I did is I took a knitting class 
And so oh, you can go nice. and take a class where you don't have to talk to people. You could sit there and just learn, be a, around people. And then after you feel comfortable, you can start inserting yourself in conversations or just being part of the group. But you can just sit there and be around other people. I've also done like guitar lessons and ice skating lessons, like just stuff that is just for fun. And yeah. then you end up meeting people there and you learn something new and it's fun. Yeah, and you just you're improving your life in a variety of ways. I think that's such a great mm-hmm. tip. And I really loved um the way that it seemed that you were flipping the script about what moving can be because you know, as you pointed out in the book, everyone puts moving on that list of like reasons you're going to die. Have you <laughs> you know, have you experienced the following stressors and it always includes moving and mm-hmm you're saying, hey, what if it's actually a clean slate and you're able to start your life anew? And I thought that was a really fresh approach. What what made you see it that way? Whenever we moved, I always was excited about the next move. We were always moving to a different place. And we've lived in, so we were in Maryland, Ohio, California, Illinois, Tennessee. I'm from Florida originally. And each time I just thought, okay, this is going to be something fun, something new. And I started doing the research and looking into it. And there's a lot about habit formation that I thought was really interesting that there was a study that showed that 36% of successful habit changes were attributed because of a move to a new place. So if you're trying to change your habit and you're already moving, then you're, you're ahead of the game, right? Your, mm-hmm. your chances of success are, are you know, really high. So um, having that chance for the clean slate and to have goals, like you can be anybody you want to be when you move somewhere new. Even if you're just like moving across the street yeah. and having a change in your routines too where – now in the morning, maybe you put your shoes by the front door and go for a run. Maybe you didn't do that before. Just having little things in your new space that um, that can help you out of just creating these new routines. I love that. I think it's a great outlook because instead of it being just drudgery or just something you have to do for a job, it becomes an opportunity to improve your well-being or to become who you maybe wanted to be all along. Um, and I never thought about it that way. And that's really cool. Um I was curious about, because you mentioned you have kids and you talk about in the book how moving with kids is quite different from moving on your own or with just your partner. How the heck does a person successfully move a child without scarring them? (laughs) I've talked to a lot. I've interviewed many, many people about their moves. And the overall theme that comes out is that their children are so resilient. So this is after a move. Like, what are the after effects in the move? And it is it is amazing seeing it in my own kids, and I do a lot of workshops for, for kids in, in the area, in the Chicago area, of seeing how much more confident they are because they know they can do it. They know that they can be thrown into a new situation and that they can survive and thrive. And so I think the first thing as a parent is to know, like, your kid will be okay. It will be fine. Um, and talking to them early about everything is, is important and just leaving the, the doors open for communication. And kids, one thing that was funny to me is how we as adults understand what it means to move. Like you pack up your things, you put it in a truck, you move it somewhere else. But for kids, they've mm-hmm. never done it before. So they don't know, like, is my bed coming with me? Is my dog coming with me? That, you know, there was one family that was moving and they were only moving like 10 minutes away. And their their child, he was, I think he was six years old, was, was just crying and crying because he thought they were going to leave their dog Louie behind. Right? Oh. And, he, you know, he had no idea because he'd never, he sees like the parents and like, oh, we'll leave the chandelier, we'll leave the curtains. <laughs> like, well, what about our dog? <laughs> and so just explaining to kids, like, what are the similarities and differences are between where you're moving, are they still taking the bus? Are they going to carpool now? Is there, are they still get, going to get to play soccer, be on Girl Scouts? Like what things will stay the same in their lives and what things will be different? I, there are some families I know that have moved from uh, less expensive areas to more expensive areas. And so preparing their kids like, okay, where well, our house will be smaller. Um, there will be some differences in, in, in this. And so just letting the kids know is really important. I am definitely going to employ one of your um, methods for teaching kids how to make friends. It never even occurred to me that I could facilitate my child making friends, but you describe it so so well in the book about steps you can take to get them to think of ways and places to meet people they want to hang out with. I, I'm so glad you did that. 
Thank you. Yeah, that was really, I mean, as a parent, you know, like you just, you want your kids to be happy and have all the tools that they can to, to do well. And that we, with my kids, we always just did role plays of practicing. And so I talk a lot about body language in the book and I do, a, again, a lot of workshops for kids who are new in the area and to teach them just really simple body language tips. I also have things for adults in here as well, but for the kids, it's just, you know, smile, eye contact and arms open. Right. And Seeing the kids do this in these workshops, and they are so nervous when they walk in, mm-hmm. but at the end of it, they're practicing and they've done it, and, and they're so confident. And then they make friends at the end of the session, which is my favorite part, that yeah. they're like, oh my gosh, you're in the same class. I mean, it's so it's so cute. And But just practicing. So I have a lot of, um, so in The Art of Happy Moving, I have a lot of little scenarios in there that you can practice with your kids, of role play that... It doesn't isn't necessarily like hi. It's nice to meet you. It's just role play scenarios you can do where you're paying attention to the body language mm. and just make it silly and fun with your kids because they can they see what a difference it makes when you have your arms crossed or you're not smiling when you're playing it out with them. Well, on this show, we always talk about how it's hard being a person, just being a human <laughs> in the world, and so that <laughs> one of the things that surprised me, uh, delighted me about your book is that. Yes, there are all these tips about how to how to move your stuff and get movers and find a location, but it's also about the humanness of living. And you really are you're a freaking sociologist or something. You're just really good at <laughs> unpacking, for lack of a better word, how humans <laughs> can uh, interact in the world and find a space, and also what home means. And it's so much more than just our stuff, of course. So it's very impressive what you've accomplished. Thank Um, you, Susie. I was wondering if you are one of the people that is really super into HGTV. Are you one of these people? I do love HGTV. (laughs) It saved us. It saved us from financial disaster. Tell me how. So there's uh, a couple shows. I don't know if they're still on the air, actually. Um, Homes on Homes and Homes Inspection. So have you ever seen those? No. They're home inspection. So Mike Holmes, I think they, they have a spinoff now with um, Sherry Holmes is his daughter. And mm-hmm. then there's Mike Holmes Jr. Um, and so they go through home inspections. And so my husband and I watched these religiously before we were purchasing our home. And you see how many problems people get into if they either don't have a home inspection or they don't have a good home inspector. And so we saw kind of the end result of all this terrible things that that would happen if you buy what you think is the house of your dreams and then it's a nightmare. And so we were looking at different houses and our first house that we bought, we just didn't think we could afford to pay a really high end home inspector. And we just kind of got sort of the cheapest we could get. And they said, okay, everything's great. So we left for a weekend. We came back, and our our townhouse just reeked of gas. Oh my god! And it turned out that there were eight gas leaks in our home, <laughs> and I was seven or eight months pregnant at the time. <laughs> and they and the gas company just shuts it off, and they they won't turn it back on until you fix it. And it took forever to get someone to come out and fix it. So there I am, like you know, seven eight months pregnant. Oh there's no hot water. There's no <laughs> stove. I was like, please, somebody come. And so finally, we got it fixed. And so we learned for now. Then it was our third home that we purchased. To just we we spent the extra money. We got a quality home inspector, and we thought we found the house of our dreams. Loved it. Like I, I talk about, don't fall in love with the house in the book, <laughs> and I think that's very important. But this was like we had gotten all the way to the end stages, and I thought like, okay, this is just a formality. We're I, I can pretty much love it now because it's yeah. almost done. But um, they went through the guy. His name was Tom. He went through the house and he found every issue you could imagine. I mean, it was like a foundation issue and leaking in the walls and electrical and there were rats. There was every, like everything. This is crazy. And, How did the yeah, first guy miss said, it? I, I, I don't know. It was, it was unbelievable. All these structural things that he found. And he said, look, I'll stop the home inspection right now, halfway through and give you half your money back. And we're like, just finish it, find everything. And oh. because I had seen the homes inspection, everything on TV and seeing what happens after the fact, like if you still go through with what you think is your dream home, even if you know there are all these problems or if you found, you know, just knowing yeah. how terrible it could be, I said, okay, we, we have to walk away from this. There's, 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 this would just be a financial disaster for us, plus the emotional side of it. So yes, 
Um, HGTV <laughs> saving <us>. lives <laughs> from financial amazing. ruin. <laughs> Don't you think it's funny on the HGTV shows when they show like a couple that's house hunting and they'll be like, she's a cashier and he's like, you know, a stay at home dad and they have a budget of $4 million. <laughs> it never makes sense. I'm always like, how is that possible? But, what shows do you like? Um, I, well, just recently I dove into the, uh, the gains ones that chip and Joanna, what the heck's that oh, show? Yes. I forget what yeah, it's called. Uh, Fixer Upper? Yeah, man. People are obsessed. I was like, what is the hype about? And I tuned in, I'm like, oh, they're adorable. Yeah, like they are. what's not to love and I want all of their homes. So I get it. <laughs> um, do you think you will move again? I said never, but probably. <laughs> <laughs> if we're being honest, really? You yeah, think? Probably. I mean, yeah. So the average American moves 11.7 times in their lifetime. So we still have a couple more in us, oh I think. <laughs> One thing I really liked the suggestion that you made was the location specific gratitude journal. Did, how the heck did you come up with that? That's a brilliant idea. Tell them what it is. So the location-specific gratitude journal is to figure out what you love about where you live now so that you can figure out what things would be important to you and where you move. And the reason that I thought of this was because I made the mistake of not doing that, where we were looking, we were living in Chicago, and we could have moved anywhere in the country. And we bought a map from Target, like in the dollar bin, and we had a puzzle puzzle map, and we just started throwing out states. Like, okay, we don't want to live there. We don't want to live there. So finally we <laughs> picked, we're like, Tennessee is where we want to go. And so Dan got a job offer there, and we're going to move to Knoxville, Tennessee. And if you look at the pros and cons, there's no state income tax there. It's low cost of living. It's beautiful weather. It's, it's beautiful out there in general. It's by the Smoky Mountains. We're like, this is, of course, we should move to Knoxville. But what I didn't really do is just evaluate myself. And I have learned I'm much more of a city person. And also having a gratitude journal of like things I love about Chicago. Like I love Lake Michigan. Mm. I love going to the comedy clubs and the theater. And there's all these things about Chicago that – I really missed when I moved to Knoxville. And so now that we're back, I realized like I need to take advantage of all these things that I missed. And mm. so doing it in the, in sort of a different way is like, do that before you move. <laughs> It'll yeah. save you from moving somewhere that may not be the best fit for you. Yeah. What a great idea. Cause then people can also appreciate what they ha- have had and hopefully get that in the new location as well. It's dr- just a great yeah. idea. Um, Thanks. I think it also helps your happiness in general when you're yeah. grateful for just for things, right, of your family, your friends and everything. But having a location one, I've been doing it a lot now since we've moved back where, and for me, it's just on Instagram. Like I'll post, you know, gratitude for Lake Michigan or something where just recognizing like what is special about where you live and it'll just make you feel happier about, about your everyday living. I think that's brilliant. Um, we have a question we ask everyone, which is, I... I'm really depending on you to, because I feel like you have an interesting trunk of your car. So what do you keep in the trunk of your car if you have a car? Uh, I keep water bottles. Do you? <laughs> yes, I have lots of water bottles. Wait, are you just really um, into hydration or is this for an emergency <laughs> situation? Uh, I think having with three kids, I love the yeah. beach. And so just the idea that I might be able to go to the beach at any moment. And in case I'm thirsty, I, I just always have a water bottle. No, that's good. I like that idea. All right. Is that it? Is it empty otherwise? Uh, It depends on the season. We have a lot of beach chairs in there because of soccer season. And then again, beach time. I love that you're a beach chair enthusiast. (laughs) So it's winter nine months of the year, but I I still have my my beach chairs in there. That is (laughs) so funny. (laughs) Are they the $10 CVS ones? Uh, I think now they're like $15 from like Dick Sporting Goods. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> We've upgraded. <laughs> I just added something to my trunk. Our listeners will be happy to know. I just put in there an emergency hoodie because you know how like you go out and you're freezing. I had to buy a $65 hoodie one day because I was so cold and I was like, never again. I'm keeping this in the car. So I just added that. And I feel like that's a good I, move. You're in LA, right? Yeah, but it's been cold. Yeah. I am not happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I had to do Here it. Here I am, like wishful dreaming of like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I I'm feel jealous. like you Very guys jealous. have had better weather than we have lately. It's not been good out here, man. I'm telling you. No, 
I don't believe it. I'm so jealous. <laughs> it's, it's, it's 40 degrees over here today. Is it really? <laughs> Yeah, yep. Oh, dang, that it's is worse. like a week and a half ago or two weeks ago. It was, it's been crazy. <laughs> I should quit complaining then. At any rate, <laughs> I know that our listeners are going to love the art of happy moving. And I think it's essential for anyone that will be going anywhere, which is most of us. Um, so congratulations. And uh, what do you think is next for you? Um, I'm not sure. Probably day at the beach. My God. <laughs> um, but after that, I don't know. I um, I love talking to people about moving and helping families through it and individuals That's that are going nice. through it. So, so we'll see. You found your niche. That's amazing. And I can't wait to hear what our <laughs> listeners think of your book. So congratulations. Great. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This podcast is brought to you by Wave Podcast Network. Check out all of our shows, including the Brain Candy Podcast, I Don't Get It, Coffee Convos, and Let's Talk About It.